Well, good morning and happy Sunday to you all our family. Thank you for tuning in once again. I also want to thank you for your continued support. We can't do what we do without you. Uh, if you're familiar with the book of Philippians, that book is virtually a letter uh, that Paul wrote to that church. A big portion of that uh, contains his sentiment and he expressed his gratefulness and appreciation for his partners. We've always wanted to do that as it concerns our partners, you being our partners, our online friends and family. So we can't, uh, can't forget to thank you and express our appreciation for you. Um, again, we can't do what we do without you. And God wants to reward you for your partnership. So let's look at that. Let's look at that. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And let's look at verse 19. Now, this is a very popular scripture that many believers lay claim to. But when you read it in its context, this is a promise that the Apostle Paul shared with his partners. And so you, as our online friends and family, you're our partners. And this, this promise applies to you because you're doing uh, what's conditioned, what, you know, what's conditioned in this promise. You're meeting those conditions, better way of saying it. And uh, verse 19, it says, and my God will liberally supply, fill to the full your every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read that one more time. It says, my God will liberally supply that means fill to the full your every need. Now, your every need, when it, as it pertains to us, as the people of God, there's three parts of us, spirit, soul, and body. And the needs that God is talking about addressing and fulfilling to the full uh, pertain to all three of those areas of our lives. Now, when you partner with us, when you give your tithes and your offerings, when you sow into the life of, of our pastor, God's promise is to supply all your needs because you've exchanged, you've exchanged money for something better. You've exchanged money, which is referred to as the unrighteous mammon, for the true riches. Amen. And the true riches, the reason they're true is because they cover every need. Money can take care of our, our needs in the natural, but God can take care of the needs of our soul, or the eternal part of us, which is much more important, which is higher on God's list of priorities. Amen. So you as believers, have positioned yourself to receive the riches that are true. Amen. God wants you to have an excellent soul. The Bible talks about excellence of soul. The Bible uh, talks about spiritual prosperity. And, and, and those who partner in the, the uh, advancement of the gospel, they meet the conditions for that. And so you as a result of your partnership, can and should expect God to supply not just your financial and material needs, but the needs of your soul, the needs of, of your inner man. God, God, God has a liberal supply of peace. God has a liberal supply of joy. Amen. God has a liberal supply of patience. He has a liberal supply of long suffering. He has a liberal supply of love. He has a liberal supply of grace. And grace will meet all of our evil tendencies. Grace is the ability that enables us to overcome sin in our lives. Now, money can't do that. Amen. God 
God has the ability to open the eyes of our heart so that we can see the riches of the glory in Christ Jesus. God wants to share those riches with us. And when you partner with the ministry like this, God can and will do that. So when you sow today, when you tithe, look for God to open the windows of heaven. Look for God to open the eyes of your heart. And God will enable you to see Christ in you. He'll, he'll enable you to perceive his person. He'll enable you to perceive the reality and experience the reality of Christ in you. Now you're talking about riches. You're talking about true wealth. Uh, what an honor to be able to perceive and experience the riches of his glory. The Holy Spirit, his job is to make Christ known unto us. And when you partner with the ministry, the Holy Spirit will do that. Amen. He'll make Christ known unto you. Now you're talking about riches. There's no greater honor than to know the Lord Jesus. There's no greater honor and nothing to be desired more than eternal life. And what is eternal life? Eternal life is knowing the Father and knowing the Son intimately to the point where the life of the Father and the life of the Son, eternal life, now begins to manifest in you and become more and more apparent in your life. Amen. That's our destiny. Our destiny is to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, where his life becomes increasingly apparent in our life. Amen. So I want to thank you for your, your gifts. Thank you for your support. But I also want to encourage you to expect God to supply all your needs. Expect God to give you the ability to lay hold of eternal life. Expect God to, to, to give you the ability to perceive Christ in you and to literally experience him personally. Experiencing, experience him, experiencing him to the point where he begins to live in and through you. Amen? So, again, I want to thank you uh, for your, your partnership today. We have two, two uh, options available for you with regard to your giving. Number one, you can go to VineLifeChristianFellowship.com and do your giving online. And we've also provided our address to the ministry in a description box located at the bottom of your screen. You can use that address to mail in your gifts, your tithes and your offerings and your partnership. Amen. Now it's Sunday and want to close out this portion of our service by offering you an opportunity to sow into the favorite seed. This is a seed over and above your regular tithes and offerings. And normally we challenge 50 people. It's not limited to that. To sow a $50 seed over and above your regular tithes and offerings. Now that $50 is simply a goal. It's not, it's not a demand. It's just a goal. You can go beyond that. And if you don't have it, you can give less. The whole, the whole thing is we're demonstrating to God that we trust in him. We're demonstrating to God. Through our giving, we're demonstrating to God. We're communicating that we put our hopes on him and not on our money. Amen? So expect God to supply all your needs as a result of your giving. And we thank you. All right, now it's time for us to get into the word for today. And uh, this being the month of December, in light of the word that our pastor received at the beginning of the year, that word is that 2022 is the year of repentance, the year of turning away from sin and turning to God in devotion. Now, as it pertains to devotion, uh, the Spirit of God led our pastor to distinguish three distinct and key areas in which we're focused on, we're, we're devoted in these areas. 
the Bible in Hebrews chapter 6 uh, exhorts us and challenges us to show the same diligence and sincerity, the same diligence and sincerity all the way through. Now we have a short-term goal. Uh, as I said before, the, this year being the year of repentance. So the remaining few weeks of this year look to, to, to maintain the same diligence and sincerity in these three areas. Number one, spending time with God at your house. Hopefully by now you've designated a prayer closet, a place where you can have privacy between you and God to hear his voice and so he can hear your voice. A place where you can go and sing to him and express your gratitude, your appreciation, your awe and admiration for the Lord. Amen. Number two, uh, we're looking to apply diligence and sincerity, especially for the remainder of this year, this next few weeks, in being faithful to the assembly, coming to church whenever the doors are open. Now, you're familiar with our, our service times. If you're not, I'll put you in remembrance of that. Our Sunday service is at 915. We have two Bible studies each Tuesday. The morning Bible study is at 10 a.m. The evening Bible study is at 7 p.m. So I encourage you, especially if you're in the area, to apply diligence and sincerity in coming to church. And then number three, the area of giving, tithes and offerings, and also being a blessing to those in the body of Christ and to all people. Amen. So the, the important thing for us to know and what we've been placing emphasis on as of late is that at the heart of our devotion being secure in these three areas, at the heart of us applying diligence and sincerity in these three areas is the perfection of our faith. That's our destiny. Our destiny. Um, our destiny as believers is to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, share inwardly his likeness. But the key to that, the key to that is the perfection of our faith. And uh, I want to show you that in Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And I like the way this reads out of the King James Version. So we'll read this scripture out of the King James Version first. The Apostle Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. We all want to have that same testimony. Now watch this. He says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He didn't say, I just live by faith. He was very specific. The life uh, I live now in the now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So in order for Christ to live in us, we have to live by faith. Our faith needs to be perfected. And this faith is the faith of the Lord Jesus. He imparted it to us. He shares it, shares it with us. That's why the Bible says that we receive the measure of faith. It tells us uh, to, to, to have a sober view of ourselves. It's interesting that it says that in light of faith. So what is a sober view of yourself? That's us viewing ourselves in light of our need to depend totally on God. When, when, when the, and the Lord Jesus, uh, by way of the Holy Spirit, is the one who helps us develop this sober view. Amen. That's a part of the perfection of our faith. We don't have an innate awareness of our need to depend on and, and to rely on God. We don't, we're not born with that, but the Holy Spirit reveals that to us, especially when we're going through trials. Amen. 
Now let's read that same scripture, Galatians 2 and 20, out of the Amplified. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. In him I have shared his crucifixion. It is no longer I who live, but Christ the Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in. Now he goes on to explain what that is. Faith in is adherence to and reliance on and complete trust in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's a description of mature or perfected faith. And that's, that's what God is doing in you and I um, through our devotion. As, do, as we apply diligence and sincerity in the area of spending time with God at our home, in the area of our church attendance, as we apply diligence and sincerity in the area of giving, this is what the Lord is doing on the inside of us, bringing our faith into maturity bringing our faith into perfection. Amen. So that's what we've been emphasizing and we'll continue to do that today. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And I believe you've, you've had time to locate Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus. Now, Jesus he is the leader and the source of our faith. Giving the first incentive for our belief and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. Jesus is the source of our faith. Giving the first incentive for our belief and is also its finisher bringing it, our faith, to maturity and perfection. Now, guess who else is very familiar with this scripture? You guessed it, our adversary, a Satan. Now, Satan, knowing full well that Jesus is the source of our faith, Satan, knowing that Jesus uh, is the one who develops and brings our faith into maturity and perfection. It's obvious that Satan's effort is to cause separation between us and the source and the developer of our faith. Amen. That's why you and I have to apply Diligence and sincerity as it pertains to our devotion. Now, many of us, if not all of us, many of us are now living in the environment in which God uses to perfect and develop our faith. Many of us are, are living in the environment in which God uses to bring our faith to the place of maturity. And we've been talking about that. The environment is, is uh, summed up in this one word, trial. Many of us are going through trials. Many of you, many of us are going through the hardest time that we've ever gone through. But we can take heart knowing this, knowing this, that this is the environment that is needed for the perfection of our faith. This is a dangerous time because we have an adversary. And the adversary will attempt to use this environment to use trials against us. Otherwise, Otherwise, it wouldn't be called the trying of our faith. The devil has plans for your life, just like God has plans for your life. But it's important 
that we know what to do when we're being tested so that we can come through the test the way God intended us to come out. Now, if we look at reality, not everybody comes out with perfected faith. There are many casualties of trials. Amen. How many of you know that faith is a fight? Where we're instructed to fight the good fight of faith. Not everybody sees it as a good fight. But those of us whom God has taught see faith as a good fight because Jesus told us that in this world we will have trouble. But be of good cheer. He told us to be of good cheer. Why? Because he's already overcome the world. And guess what? He's in us, and we're in him. Therefore, we've already overcome. That overcoming is a spiritual reality that we need to fight for in the natural. But the Lord Jesus, living in us, can share his perspective. Amen. The Bible says that we're seated with him in heavenly places. But the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ in us, can share that reality with us as we're going through. That's the beauty of having the author and the finisher of our faith living on the inside of us because we have access to his personal human experience. Amen. Go to, um, go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Now, been emphasizing point number one, us fellowshipping with God because Christ, Christ in us, he wants to share the, his own human experience with us so that we come out more like him. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, it says, for because he, Jesus himself, in his humanity, has suffered, being tempted, tested, and tried, he is able, when, immediately, to run to the cry of assist and relieve those who are being tempted and tested and tried, and who therefore are being exposed to suffering. Now, the reason Jesus suffered is to help us. To help us. Knowing that, Satan knowing that, he wants to keep us from engaging in fellowship with the source of our faith. The one who has the responsible, responsibility of developing it and bringing it into maturity and perfection. And he's an expert at doing that. But this is what God wants us to know. Go over to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. And it reads, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weakness and infirmities and liability to the salts of temptations, but one who has been tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sinning. So we have, we have access to Jesus in real time. And see, when, when the, the Christ, Jesus who lives in us, Christ in us, he is not, it, it says, he is who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with us. We don't have that type of high priest. We have a high priest living on the inside of us who is able to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weakness and our infirmities and liability to the assaults of temptations. 
he, he, he has a shared feeling because he went through the same thing before us so that when we go through it, he's here to assist us. He's here to share his experience with us. Amen. What an awesome God we serve. That's a different, that's what distinguishes our God among, from, from all the other false gods. No other God wrapped himself in human flesh. No other God proved his love in that manner to which he would leave heaven, come down to earth in the likeness of sinful flesh and subject himself to every temptation known to man so that he can have a place of, of empathy and sympathy for us. So that he can help us as we go through the same experiences. Amen. Look at um, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. As we, as we engage in fellowship with the Lord Jesus at our home, we're engaging with one whom subjected himself to every temptation known to man. And he never, he never yielded to that temptation. He never was overcome by that temptation. He never sinned. And he wants to share that experience with us. That's awesome. The burden of the maturity of our faith is not on us, it's on him. And all of, all of us need to experience his personal involvement. Amen. His personal involvement in the development of our faith. He wants us to understand that he has a shared feeling with us so that we can draw close to him without any sense of judgment. He wants us to draw close to him. See, that's why Jesus shed his blood and at the heart of it is the cleansing our conscience from guilt and from shame. See, all the things that we do should never be done out of a sense of guilt and out of a sense of shame. The Bible talks about the, the, the blood of Jesus accomplishing the riddance of guilt. So if you and I are, are, are harboring guilt, we haven't allowed the blood of Jesus to do what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to cleanse our conscience. And, and, and once, see, the Holy Spirit will lead you into that reality. And once that happens, we'll be free from guilt. And we'll be free from shame. And that will lift us out of the place of dead works. What is a dead work? A uh, classic example of a dead work is reading the Bible, expecting or reading the Bible for the purpose of, 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 of obtaining righteousness. You can read the Bible uh, from cover to cover. It has nothing to do with your righteousness. That is not a way or a means to achieve righteousness. A dead work is tithing to be accepted by God. A dead work is, is obeying what the Bible tells you to do or obeying uh, the different conditions that are laid out in the Bible with the expectation that if I keep this commandment, God now accepts me. No, God accepts you because Christ died and shed his blood for you and you received the gift of righteousness simultaneously when you received Christ. So that's, that's the end of us attempting to achieve a righteousness of our own. The Holy Spirit has to bring you into that reality. See, this is why our fellowship, our personal fellowship is key. Amen. 
Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, for it was not worthy of God, fitting to the divine nature, that he for whose sake and by whom all things have their existence and bringing many sons into glory should make the pioneer of their salvation. What is a pioneer? He's the first one. He's the first one. The pioneer of their salvation. Perfect. Should bring to maturity the human experience necessary to be perfectly equipped for his office as high priest through suffering. Suffering is the route that Jesus went through. Him being our pioneer means that we got to go through that same route. But when we go down that route that Jesus already went down, the Christ who's living in us wants to assist us. How? By sharing his own experience going down this route. Amen. We have access, personal access, to Jesus' human experience. He wants to share his mindset with us. He wants to share his grace with us. He wants to impart his ability so that we come out more like him. So that we come out with our faith being perfected. We make progress in the perfection of our faith. The burden is not on us. It's on him. And he wants you to come close to him. So you can partake of what he's sharing. What is he sharing? His own human experience. Being tested and tempted. Jesus went through uh, the trying and the testing of his faith prior to us. Therefore, he's, he's able to assist us. But again, he comes, to the, uh, he comes to assist us when we cry out to him. And that's what trials are meant to do. God, when you're in a trial... God will use the, those painful circumstances to cause you to cry out. You'll find yourself in a, in a place where you can't do anything to get out of it. And when we cry out to God, he's there to assist us. When we cry out to the Lord Jesus, he's there to assist us. He's there to share his own personal experience with us. Looking away from all that will distract under Jesus. Under Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. The one who subjected himself to the trying of his faith so that we who are coming after him can, can have access to his personal assistance, his personal experience. An example of this in, in my own life. If you turn to John 13, I heard the Lord Jesus speak this to me, and it really got my attention. He says, you know, I'm not mad at Judas. And uh, when he said that, I was just like, you know, it really got my attention. And this is the scripture that came to mind, John 13 and 18. This is what Jesus was saying to the disciples. He says, I'm not speaking of, and I do not mean all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread with me has raised up his heel against me. Now, when Jesus said, I'm not mad at Judas, he said that to teach me. He's sharing his personal experience with me to help me have the same mindset. Uh, in situations where I've been offended. And it's helped me greatly because this is how Jesus looked at his own betrayal. It says, but it was that the scripture may be fulfilled. So Jesus having foreknowledge that he would be betrayed. He didn't attack Judas. After this betrayal happened, Jesus looked at it 
the way he was supposed to look at it. This betrayal happened so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, when he said that to me, immediately all the pieces of the puzzle fell in place. Well, you think about it. If there's no betrayal, then there's no trial. If there's no trial, there's no, there's no crucifixion. If there's no crucifixion, then there's no salvation. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that all things work together for, for the good, for good to those who are called by God, those who, those, who, those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's a perfect example of that. Because the next scripture talks about our transformation. So that's the good. Everything that happens to us, whether it's, no matter how painful it is, is fitting into God's plan of transformation. And so that, that what I'm saying is a result of Jesus sharing with me from his own experience. And that's given me a new perspective on painful situations that I've gone through with people. And now I see beyond the pain. I see beyond what was done and I see into the purpose of it. It's so that the plan of God, that I might pr make progress in the plan of God, just like Jesus did, without, without Jesus sharing that with me. I'm reacting just like every, every human. And I'm, I'm mad at the person. I'm saying, how can they do this to me? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus said, this happened so that the scripture might be fulfilled. God is good. In the trials that we're going through, we have to see it for what it is. These trials are fitting into God's plan of our transformation into the image of Jesus Christ. And I'm just sharing that with you as an example of how beneficial it is for us to share in the human experience of our Lord Jesus and how that's an aid to us in the perfection of our faith. Amen. I want to thank you for tuning in once again. Continue to thank you for your support. Want to also end by, you know, in the service, as I always do, encouraging you to come and join us in person. The day is approaching. Come and join us in person so that you can hear the word of God and faith will come. Faith will come. You'll make progress in the development of your faith as you hear the word of God being preached by the man of God. Don't, don't try to arrive at your destiny without that key element. Don't, don't think that you're an exception to the rule. Us assembling ourselves together with other believers is, is a key part of us being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It's a key part in the perfection of our faith. Amen. Well, having said that, God bless you. Thank you for tuning in once again, and enjoy the rest of your day. For more information on Vine Life Christian Fellowship, please visit our website at www.vinelifechristianfellowship.com. Options concerning the tithe, offerings, partnership, or favor challenge are located in the description box below. It is our hope that you have been blessed and enlightened by this message. As we begin our online journey, we encourage you to subscribe to this channel, ensuring that you will not miss future messages. On behalf of Vine Life Christian Fellowship, we would like to thank you for joining us. Have a blessed day, and we will see you next time.